Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward, and this is Face to Face. Our guest this week is Don Worm. Don is one of the leading criminal defense lawyers in Saskatchewan and one of the founding members of the Indigenous Bar. He has been involved in a number of high profile cases, including those of Neil Stonechild and Dudley George. In 2013, Don won $14.7 million on the Lotto 649. His family used the money to create a foundation. Don, welcome to the show. It's a real pleasure to uh, be able to sit here with you and, and speak with you. Uh, I feel that we could do a whole episode on the uh, Stone Child inquiry and case, but it, it has been 20 years uh, since the death of Neil Stone Child and a little over 15 years uh, since the inquiry came out. Uh, what are your reflections on, mm, on all well that? It, I'll tell you, first of all, uh, it doesn't seem that long. It might be uh, 15 years or so since the, uh, uh, since the report of the Stone Child Inquiry. But I think what we've seen are, are several steps forward since that time, at least in the relationship between Indigenous people and the police services in the city of Saskatoon. We know that with the uh, implementation of the 100 or uh, thereabouts recommendations that Mr. Justice Wright uh, put forward at the Stone Child Inquiry report, that uh, most, if not all of those, had been implemented and it resulted in uh, a change not only in the relationship but in, in the way that the police service was conducted vis-a-vis -vis Indigenous people in Saskatoon. What I can tell you is that in the most recent years we've begun to have a bit of a slip back on that. There have been new policies that have been in implemented and I think we are again seeing uh, where Indigenous people in this city are being profiled where uh, we're going back to a situation where indigenous people are on the uh, short end of the stick, so to speak, when it comes to policing services in this in this city. Uh, part of it uh, is undoubtedly due to the rise of other social dysfunctions that uh, we were warned about and that we have had tried to uh, explain to to the policing services and to the leaders that there are uh, are incredible difficulties that are happening within society. Uh, particularly among young people, and a lot of that has its genesis, as you know, in uh, the residential school catastrophe, which left many of our communities um, in in shambles, and we are still recovering from that. How would you, uh, you know, you say it doesn't feel like it's been 15, 20 years. What, how would you describe the relationship that existed back then between Indigenous people and uh, the police service here? Well, the, uh, there was no relationship, I think. Uh, that, that was made fairly clear. And when you have instances where, uh, in the case of uh, the late Neil Stonechild, where the investigation uh, of, his, uh, of his death in very alarming circumstances uh, consumed no more than four days of a, of a police officer's time, and they simply closed the book on that. That was the relationship. And how would you say it has... Uh changed since then. Uh, like you say, many of the recommendations have, uh, have been implemented. One that uh, people still call for is the uh, like to see an outside police force look into police matters. Uh, is that something you'd still like to see happen to you? That is, uh, that is obviously a fundamental shortcoming in the, in the oversight of police services in the province of Saskatchewan at least. As you know, uh, in other provinces there are civilian oversight bodies that provide that sort of oversight of policing services. We don't have that here. And uh, I've said before that there is nothing that erodes public trust like police investigating police. What uh, do you think is the reason why that hasn't happened? Like you say, in other jurisdictions, you, I think of Ontario and Manitoba, there are civilian or, or outside independent uh, commissions that look into uh, police matters like that. I have no idea why that is so. We hear various complaints from governments as to why they will not uh, engage in a process that is fundamentally far uh, more just uh, and will provide a greater sense of confidence. We hear things like uh, there's financial issues, there are other issues, but I don't, I don't think that those uh, should in any way inhibit uh, the kinds of changes that are necessary in order to engender the kinds of uh, trust that, that citizens need in police services generally. You feel there's a, a slip back uh, to the way things were. Uh, how do you change that right now? 
Well, I think what we do is that we continue in this process uh, and the discussions that were, that were uh, really inspired uh, by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to talk about uh, and inform Canadians about what the circumstances of Aboriginal people in this country are so that uh, Canadians can understand that the, the root of many of, uh, of the issues that they see our community suffering that in fact our governments have been the author of that. I think that that discussion needs to continue. I think that when, when uh, governments and organizations begin to understand these things, I think that they are more inclined to uh, initiate changes on their own, that they begin to find uh, recognition within their, their corporate culture uh, of these issues and begin the, the very difficult process of um, looking at, at their own organizations and seeing what sort of uh, measures are required in order to build the kind of, of, uh, of country that I think all our children deserve. We're talking about the Saskatoon police force, but uh, is this a Saskatoon issue? I mean, I think of Thunder Bay and the reports that have been done there and, and other police forces in the country. Is this uh, not just a, a Saskatoon issue? It is not just a Saskatoon issue. I mean, the issue between uh, law enforcement and Indigenous people has been one that is prevalent since uh, the, the government brought in uh, brought in the Northwest Mounted Police uh, in order to uh, to enforce what were really unjust laws at the time, including, for example, the past system, which has no basis in law, in fact, but it was simply a policy that someone had dreamed up in order to further repress uh, Indigenous people, and in particular Indians in this country. I think of uh, <coughs> you also worked, as we said, uh, on the Ipperwash inquiry, which is something that... Uh, <laughs> People have been speaking about uh, lately because of the fact that uh, Dudley George was killed by an OPP sniper. Um, what are your thoughts when you when you think back on that inquiry and where things are at today? Right. Well, uh, the death of Dudley George was clearly the impetus uh, that that uh, eventually the Ipperwash inquiry was called to address. What it looked at was the. What, what that inquiry looked at in, uh, specifically was the relationship between political actors and police services and whether or not police, uh, police enforcement ought to be driven by, by politicians. And indeed, clearly, that is not the way that our system has been built. That is not the way things ought to operate. And that was clearly a finding at the end of the day at, by uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Justice Linden uh, in the Ipperwash inquiry that while the provincial government under Premier Mike Harris, as he then was, was uh, uh, not directly responsible for forcing the police to go forward. They certainly played a major role in instigating and accelerating the kind of action that the police services had taken, which ultimately resulted in the death of Dudley George. Working so closely on that and, and <coughs> seeing what was taking place recently in Ontario with the OPP, the blockades at Ty and Denega, uh, was that on your mind? And do you think that, you know, some of those recommendations that the OPP took those into account when, when you know, giving time for this blockade? Absolutely, actually? absolutely. Uh, it seemed to me that uh, that lessons have been learned by the Ontario Provincial Police uh, from the Ipperwash inquiry. That clearly the manner in which they had addressed this, uh, at least in my estimation, seeing it from afar. Uh, it appeared to me that there was uh, a high degree of restraint that was employed. Mm -hmm. uh, they followed uh, some of the practices, the best practices that were outlined uh, in the Ipperwash Inquiry uh, Judicial Report at the end of the day. And it seems to me that, uh, that, that there is, um, that I think that there's some, some reason to be, uh, you know, to, to be pleased with, with the way that they went in and uh, without accelerating and without the violent confrontations that we've seen in the past. Do you think that was a, a direct relation to the Ipperwash inquiry? I would say it was because we know that uh, in previous instances before the kinds of recommendations and studies that the Ipperwash inquiry had undertaken, we know that uh, that was a tactic of the police. It was simply confrontation. Done much more to talk about here. We do just have to step aside for a quick break and then we'll Continue the conversation here on Face to Face with Don Worm. 
Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is prominent lawyer Donald Worm. And Don, uh, uh, you often represent families, Indigenous families, who are uh, at odds with the justice system or, or police. And I think of Matthew Dumas, who was shot and killed by police in Winnipeg, or Canoe James, who died in a psychiatric center. Uh, wh why do those cases, why are those cases that uh, you typically take on? Well, I, I'm not sure. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, uh, early on in my life, it became apparent to me that there is tremendous injustice in this world and that too often Indigenous people are on the receiving end of that. I've seen that from uh, growing up with my grandfather who, uh, who raised us. We know that uh, the policies of of Indian Affairs and the uh, oppression of the Indian Act had uh, caused him not only to lose his children to the residential school uh, system, which uh, wounded him gravely, but he lost his, his farm and all of, the, all of his effort of his life's work because he was unable to sell his produce. The Indian agent simply took it. So we know from, from uh, our own life experience, many of us, that there is grave injustice and we need people to stand up and speak to it and that's what he instilled in us and so I think that that's why I've I've had um, the inspiration I don't I wouldn't say it's courage because I've taken these on not in a courageous way but in a way that uh, really cried out to me to be able to try to do something for these folks and uh, we've had the good fortune to have to have positive results in many in many of these instances what role did your upbringing play in your childhood d into you know the lawyer that you are today and, and, and the work that you take on I right, well I, I think that that's probably it right there the uh, the fact of the matter is is that um, my mother was murdered uh, along with uh, along with three of my sisters all died at the hands of violent men um, my brothers and I were cast into the into the uh, child welfare system and uh, we spent too long a time there away from our own homes and our our own communities and I was rescued by my grandfather I like to say uh, he uh, we were captured by aliens and he saved us I mean it's not it's not really funny but it's uh, it's it's a way to try to find some humor in a very dark situation but we always thank the Creator that we had our grandfather in our lives and to instill the kinds of values in us to uh, to make us men and to make us uh, believe in what's right do you uh, tell that story often to people as inspiration? You know, people go through tough times, but there's still a way to, to rise above that uh, and look where you are today. I, I don't tell that too often. I mean, it is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a sad, sad chapter. But I, but I do understand that uh, there are people who can take inspiration from that. And I, and I do hope that that happens. I do hope that people can be inspired by some of the things that... Uh, I've been privileged to be able to do. Uh, I have worked for, for many, many outstanding and wonderful people, and each of them have brought something to me that makes me a better person as well. As a founding member of the Indigenous Bar Association, how have you seen uh, the, the change in Indigenous lawyers out there? Yeah, well, I see a tremendous change, uh, Dennis. There has been uh, leaps and bounds forward in the in the legal profession for indigenous people we had our first meetings of the indigenous bar association not in a in a phone booth I know not many people know what a phone booth is anymore but in a very small boardroom where uh, there was there was just but a handful of us uh, at, back in back in that day but since uh, 1985 our numbers have grown from uh, around uh, 200 as we were then or less than 200 upwards to something like 1800 to 2000 today so I see that there are remarkable uh, advances have been made by indigenous people in the legal profession and we see many of them are extremely successful in going forward and I uh, I, I watch with in awe and I watch with great anticipation of the of the wonderful things that these young people are going to be doing in the future they will pick up the work that that we have picked up from those before us and I know that they will they will uh, advance us into the future and that they will build the world that uh, that we want the flip side I guess to that is 
<clears throat> the numbers that we see of indigenous peoples who are incarcerated today is, uh, in today, uh, the prairies are particularly uh, <laughs> bad. Um, why do you think we, we continue to see these rising numbers? Yeah. That is the most disturbing, the most disturbing part of my work, especially in, in the uh, criminal law work that I've done for the last 33 years. I have, uh, I'm now and have, have been working for the grandchildren of uh, some of my clients way back in the day on very serious charges uh, and it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. The promise of Glad You never materialized. And Glad You, of course, spoke to the provision in the criminal code which uh, directs courts to look at every option other than uh, before they look at incarceration for indigenous people. And there were very specific steps set out in, by the Supreme Court of Canada and Glad You. Uh, IP Lee, which stood on top of Glad You and, and restated the principles from Glad You that there is something needs to be done to interrupt the constant jailing of indigenous people. Unfortunately, the numbers uh, have gotten worse since then. You're someone who pushes for Indigenous tradition in, in the legal system. How would that look, and, and do you think that that would help bring down some of these numbers? Well, it's not just Indigenous tradition, but it's Indigenous laws, and it needs to be understood that uh, there are Indigenous laws and that, and that those traditions arise out of those laws. Those laws have been here since time immemorial. I can tell you that uh, very early on in my career, one of, the, one of the processes that we attempted to instill were healing circles. Uh, those healing circles were, were set up like uh, a court in a way. At least the judge was there, the prosecutors were there, the victims were there, and we sat around in a circle to talk about how to integrate a victim and uh, how to integrate a perpetrator uh, back into the community, how to bring those folks back into the community. Um, and there were, there were strides made. The unfortunate part about it is that when there are strides, it seems to me, in, in, in bringing Indigenous laws and Indigenous traditions into the court system, the courts get very jealous and they want to take over that system. And very soon those healing circles became sentencing circles. And it became that it, it was just another process for McJustice where oh, you can't take two days to sentence somebody because you have to deal with all of these issues. Mm. Sentencing in courtrooms is, is you know, 10-minute process, half an hour. So there are those sorts of inconsistencies that we need to work out and that we need to be prepared for if we are going to bring back Indigenous uh, laws and traditions, which in my mind have absolutely every indication that they would change the, the system for our people. Does it concern you that some seem to try and uh, take advantage of that system as we've seen with a, a couple of high profile cases of, of people whether they're you know self-identifying or, or what have you and, and being able to access some of these? Uh well yeah it, it frankly doesn't bother me because number one I believe everybody is entitled to reclaim their heritage uh, secondly, I believe that these processes, that these indigenous laws and traditions work for non-indigenous people as well. So I have no problem with that. People try to game the system all the time. I mean, people do it in a regular court process by whatever, whatever means they can. I don't see that as being, as being uh, uh, overly problematic. No. Don, we do have to step aside <coughs> for one more quick break and then we'll continue the conversation here on Face to Face with Don Worm. Welcome back to Face to Face. Our guest this week is Don Worm. And Don, we, we've spoken about the Stone Child Inquiry and uh, Ipper Wash, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, many high profile cases for yourself. What case sticks out for you, I guess? Uh, and maybe it's not any of those uh, in your, your long tenure here. Well, I, I can't really point to any particular one. I think that they've all been. Uh, uh, to me, very important, uh, all the way from from the uh, the Kingston Prison for Women inquiry, where Madam Justice Orbour presided, and I had represented uh, Sandy Pequachon 
that's all going back all the way into the 90s, uh, all the way up to present. I, I think all of those things have had an impact on me, that they have uh, certainly been instrumental in forming who I am as a, as a person. And uh, along the way that I have learned uh, a great many things and I have met a great many absolutely outstanding people. And I've been really privileged to, uh, to do this kind of work. And I'm very grateful for it. Do you uh, think about hanging up the robe anytime soon? <laughs> <laughs> I think about it all the time because it gets very tiring. Uh, uh, it gets very tiring, uh, particularly where you don't see a, you know, a, a good end at the end of the particular road you're on. Right. And so uh, there, is a lot of, there is a lot of stress in that. And uh, one thinks about retiring often, but I think that there's still too much work to do. I do have unfinished things. I do have uh, uh, work that we are presently engaged in that is uh, important and I think will create fundamental change in this country. Yeah, speak of retiring, and, and you're somebody who could have, uh, for those who might know you through your law practice, uh, people also know that you, you had a, a sizable lottery win. Uh, right. what, uh, what was going through your mind when you saw that? ticket uh, in your hand? Well, I think all of the things that uh, I think any normal person would think about, right? This is uh, Freedom 55 or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. that this is a time that you can, uh, in my case, hang up the robes, as you say, Dennis. Uh, but on the other hand, it also occurred to me that this uh, was an extreme privilege that I had, uh, that had been visited upon, not just me, but of course my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that privilege comes a responsibility, and a responsibility to do something, to do something meaningful with that, uh, that is in keeping with the values that, uh, that I was raised with. And so uh, after a lot, of, uh, a lot of discussion and contemplation with, uh, with family and friends, we decided that we would uh, construct a foundation, uh, that uh, we would give the money to the foundation and the foundation would then use that to do the work uh, that the Creator wants done. And for us that work uh, deals primarily with uh, um, issues around missing and murdered women as, as uh, you may know. I have a particular affinity for, for that subject. Um, and so we want to support those kinds of, those kinds of efforts that that support uh, those families and those people that are in that terrible position. We, uh, we also focus on Indigenous education. That's, uh, it's great work, Don, and uh, a great place to end the show on. And we thank you so much for taking some time for us here on the show. Thank you very much, Dennis. I'm very pleased. And that is uh, all the time we do have for this week. We're always looking for new guests, so if you have any ideas, shoot us an email at news at aptn.ca. This show and past episodes are also available as podcasts. You can find those at aptnnews.ca slash face-to-face podcast. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next week.